So, guten Morgen, meine Damen und Herren. Ich danke Professor Matschulat für seine... Thank you. Thank Professor Matschulat for his invitation to Ninth Climate Days here in the very beautiful Annaberg Buchholz. My German is quite little, so I will speak in English. This is better, the best for me and also for you. So the last 50 years we've seen a, a remarkable increase in the connections in our world through global media, through the internet, hypermobility of travel, trade, flows of capital. And climate, too, has become increasingly globalized. So unlike our grandparents, we now talk easily about global climate change. We see weather disasters uh, on our TV screens all around the world. We understand the butterfly effect. Uh, so what happens in Brazil can affect uh, what happens here in Germany in the atmosphere. And yet still our in daily Europa experience hub. of weather remains very, very local. The stories that we tell each other the memories that we have, the hardships and the pleasures that uh, we experience of our climate remains rooted in particular places. So these experiences remain stubbornly local, even whilst we may easily talk about global climate change. So in this uh, talk, I want to uh, uh, try to explore this tension or this paradox or this difficulty of moving between these scales, the global and the local, and how local beliefs, our cultural practices, get involved in this uh, management. Uh, and therefore also I want to um, uh, want, want wonder whether we uh, are telling ourselves the right stories uh, about climate change. So, here are two questions. Uh, they can be rhetorical questions. I don't need you to answer them uh, out loud, but I'm interested, has anyone here seen global climate change with your eyes? Have you seen the global climate change? Or has anyone here seen your local climate change with your eyes, with your senses, here in Annaberg, perhaps? Here are three images. Uh, of different flooding uh, episodes. Is this evidence of climate change. Uh, I won't ask you to guess uh, where these are. Ich würde ja gerne, dass Sie mir mal sagen, dass um, mal I will tell you raten, was, was wir hier sehen, welche uh, New Orleans, Gebiete wir sehen. New, Or New Orleans, 2005. Uh, Bangkok, the floods in Bangkok, Bangkok in the summer of 2011. Große Hochwasser 2011 im Sommer. And quite recently in my own country, in England, we had a very wet winter. Uh, and an area of low-lying land in Somerset called the Somerset Levels was flooded for several weeks uh, on end. So are these pictures of climate change? Is this evidence of climate change? Well, actually, the New Orleans uh, hurricane uh, and the extensive flooding that followed from that was very much more likely a consequence of poor management of flood defenses and incorrect design of the levees that protected New Orleans. Uh, <coughs> climate scientists looking at the uh, storm events over Thailand in 2011 have suggested that in fact those meteorological arrangements were nothing 
particularly uh, uh, unusual, uh, and so one couldn't attribute that to climate uh, change. And then we've had a great argument in England in recent weeks about the Somerset floods. Uh, <clears throat> so uh, we have had uh, our Met Office uh, spokesman, Dan Williams, saying that um, uh, no one can make any definitive statement about whether the uh, heavy rainfalls were uh, caused by anthropogenic effects. On the other hand, we had our Prime Minister, David Cameron, in Parliament uh, saying that he was convinced uh, that these events were connected with climate change. Even whilst his Environment Secretary in the same government, Owen Paterson, uh, acknowledged uh, that in fact uh, he was very, very skeptical that these events were linked to climate change. And then we had my colleague Miles Allen at the University of Oxford uh, coming in and suggesting that maybe the Prime Minister was right uh, as a scientist uh, and that he would be quite willing to make the sort of connections that David Cameron was making. Just this little example illustrates the difficulty in public conversations that we have about making connections between what we see with our eyes and what we feel with our senses and what scientific evidence might or might not be telling us. Uh, and so I want to uh, develop my talk um, uh, following this line of thinking about how climate change is or is not made visible to us. Uh, and I'm going to do so using a, a very simple scheme that a, uh, a colleague of mine, uh, an anthropologist, Peter Rudyak Gould, uh, has recently written about, uh, which I find a very interesting way into thinking about this problem. Uh, and he talks about the invisibilists, the visibilists, and then those who, as he put it, make climate change visible. Uh, and so I'm going to uh, elaborate uh, a little bit on those three categories uh, with some uh, examples. But the reason this is an important question is that when we think about our, our publics, uh, both here and around the world, how our citizens engage with this idea of climate change matters uh, uh, very much, and our citizens are grappling with this problem. What do they see, and how do they attribute what they see to human activities uh, or not? And so a recent study uh, by uh, some of my social psychology colleagues uh, in England, just published very recently, uh, asking people, or ordinary citizens in England, um, uh, whether they believe that the recent uh, series of very cold winters that we have had, not the winter just passed, but the previous four or five winters were actually rather cold, in including two very, very cold winters. Asking citizens, were those experiences of really cold winters um, uh, evidence uh, of climate change or not? Because, of course, cold winters is not what we should have been experiencing, according to uh, all of the projections. Uh, and what their study showed was that how citizens interpreted the cold winter weather was a function of what their beliefs about climate change were. So for those citizens who believed that humans were really causing the global climate and this was a major problem, the cold winter weather was evidence that this was a real phenomenon and something to take seriously. For citizens who are much more skeptical that humans really would have a strong influence in the global climate system, then cold weather, winter weather, was evidence that, that they were correct and that really this had been a, a, an exaggeration uh, made up by scientists. So in this study, um, how people interpret what they see depends upon what they believe. So is believing seeing or is seeing believing? Which is a, a long-standing uh, philosophical uh, question, of course, that we can trace back through 
uh, human history. But the important thing is that this is a question that is applying to our citizens today when they think about climate change. How do people interpret evidence? And what role do their beliefs have? So let me um, take you through this uh, uh, typology of Peter Rudyard Gould, the invisibilists, the visibilists, and those who make climate change uh, visible. So the argument <coughs> is that the uh, invisibilists make is that finding human influence on the global climate system is something that uh, science is particularly skilled at being able to do. And, and we've just heard from Professor Schoenwieser, uh, the latest IPCC account, which brings together all of the science, uh, 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 looking at observations and at theories and at models, uh, 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 making um, uh, uh, the argument uh, from scientific uh, evidence. And so for the invisibilist position, it is scientists who have the key decisive role to play. And this is captured no better in this quote uh, from the American uh, Psychology Association Task Force on climate change from a few years ago, in which they said here, because climate change is so hard to detect from personal experience, it makes sense to leave this task to climate scientists. This makes it, climate change, a phenomenon where people have to rely on scientific models and expert judgment and or on reports in the mass media and where their own personal experience does not provide a trustworthy way to confirm the reports. Very interesting statement defending the invisibilist position. As individual citizens, we cannot see climate change ourselves. We cannot rely upon our own senses. We have to defer to the experts, to the scientists, to the graphs and the models uh, and the judgments that come from bodies uh, like the IPCC. This is the invisibilist uh, position. Uh, and so these types of graphs then become very powerful because this is the result of climate scientists constructing, in this case, uh, a thousand years of northern hemisphere temperature. Um, we see other vari variations uh, from the IPCC report. But this is the invisibilists at work, the scientists at work, helping our citizens, helping our, our neighbors to understand uh, climate change. And of course, um, the science has been uh, very, very uh, successful. Uh, it's a huge enterprise, uh, and it um, has helped us understand uh, aspects of change in our world uh, that we uh, would not have understood by other uh, means. Uh, and so, too, for the invisibilists, then it is these types of representations of future climate that our neighbors and our citizens have to rely, rely upon. The graphs, the spinning globes coming from uh, high powerful computers, um, the projections uh, uh, of what climate change will be over the next uh, 100 years. These are the uh, invisibilists at work. Or other uh, ways in which Invisibilists uh, might do their uh, job uh, in, in somewhat more uh, sophisticated or, or interactive ways um, <clears throat> would be through these types of interactive scenario uh, visualizations. This is from uh, <coughs> work done uh, over at the University of British Columbia in Vancouver. Uh, taking uh, virtual uh, simulation technologies, uh, overlaying it with various uh, imageries and GISs and uh, scientific projections of how, in this case, sea level would rise in this uh, uh, urban, suburban community of Delft, uh, just outside Vancouver. Uh, different scenarios that are simulated in these uh, uh, electronic machines, and then 
the citizens are brought in from the community to explore the consequences uh, of how they may want to manage the risks of future sea level rise. But again, this is still an invisibilist position. It requires the technical competence and expertise of scientists and technologists to help citizens see climate change. They can't see it for themselves through their own experiences. So if that is the invisibilist position, the contrast is with the visibilist position. People who, it would be argued, uh, can see climate change with their own eyes, their own physical senses. Why do I need a scientist to tell me what is happening to my local weather? when I can see the changes happening, whether in the case uh, of uh, Inuit uh, fishers uh, in the far north, or in the case of Maasai pastoralists uh, in northern Kenya, or in the case of dwellers on the Tuvalu Islands uh, in the Pacific, these people, these people can see climate change directly, without the intervention of the experts. Often these people may be talked about as reliable witnesses, people who live close to nature. And this visibilist position, of course, carries a much wider political significance too. Because these expert witnesses don't have to rely upon the elites. They don't have to rely upon Western scientists or even upon the IPCC. Their local knowledge, their experience speaks for itself. And so in a way you could uh, uh, argue that this position of the visibilists have is a way of challenging a certain form of entrenched power in the world. The visibilist position was put very well uh, uh, here by the then uh, Prime Minister of uh, Tuvalu, Prime Minister Koloa Talaki, uh, speaking to an international meeting in 2002. Flooding is already coming right into the middle of these islands destroying food, crops, and trees, which were there when I was born 60 years ago. These things are gone. Someone has taken them, and global warming is the culprit. We have seen it with our own eyes, he said. And then there are other ways, uh, uh, somewhat more mediated ways, perhaps, but uh, one could argue that these two are ways of seeing climate change in a visibilist uh, framework. Imageries like these, photographs here of the Motorach Glacier in Switzerland uh, showing a retreat uh, of glaciers over relatively short periods of time. Or perhaps even more dramatically, uh, for those who may have seen it, the movie Chasing Ice. Uh, which uh, documents the efforts of American photographer James Baylog over several years to set up photographic equipment in, the, in Alaska and Greenland, parts of Iceland, to uh, show time-lapse photography of changing glacial behavior in the high Arctic. As Baylog himself says in an accompaniment to the film, in this case, we are the messengers. We are bringing you tangible, visible evidence of the immediacy of climate change.
so these are examples then of the visiblest uh, position, which is a contrast and uh, ends up actually coming into conflict, to some extent at least, with the invisiblest uh, position. But Rudyard Gould then goes on to suggest uh, maybe a third position that is worth exploring as well. Uh, that we need to recognize uh, because it is such a powerful uh, uh, set of activities that we see around our societies today about climate change. It's what he called the making uh, climate change visible. And actually one could perhaps begin to argue that what Balog was doing with his movie Chasing Ice and his elaborate equipment um, was as much about making uh, climate change visible as about seeing it with your own eyes, because actually he wasn't seeing it with his own eyes. He was seeing it through the eyes of his cameras. So perhaps the Baylog case moves us into this third category of making uh, climate change visible. But more broadly, uh, the argument here uh, is that uh, climate change can't simply be we can't simply rely upon the scientists and their scientific tools and their arcane practices and graphs and diagrams that don't really engage people. And the problem with the, uh, uh, those who argue the visiblest position of seeing things with their own eyes is that, well, if you're not happen to be in the right place at the right time, then you, you miss out. <laughs> if you're not on the, at the beaches of Tuvalu, or on the, the, the semi-arid plains of the Turkana Basin in northern Kenya. Well, that's just tough. Um, you're excluded from this experience of seeing climate change. And so what actually happens here is these are the mediators who step in, these cultural entrepreneurs who come along and say, we're going to make climate change visible for you. Baylog, again, perhaps falls into that category. But there are many other examples uh, of this. So whether it's uh, uh, manipulating photoshopping imagery, like the, the polar bear on the stranded ice flow, which is a constructed image, or whether on the top right here it's a, a form of installed sculpture in one of our English cities, um, in one of our shopping centers, trying to uh, represent uh, what one, two, three, four meters of sea level rise might mean for the inhabitants of Bristol. Or whether, again, it's these imaginative photo creations, the bottom right here, this uh, series of photographs from a few years ago called um, Postcards from the Future. Here are Houses of Parliament uh, in Parliament Square, juxtaposed with rice paddy fields. Making climate change visible by disturbing and challenging us with these visual representations. Or we could uh, draw attention to uh, dramatists, people who actually try to tell the story of climate change through theater. Here are four examples of uh, stage plays that uh, have been on the London stage uh, in recent years, each of them taking climate change as the core plot. Uh, the contingency plan, the heretic, uh, uh, earthquakes in London uh, and Greenland. Trying to find, find ways of dramatizing the story of climate change uh, in theatrical uh, performance. These would be examples of making climate change visible. This isn't relying upon the tools of science. This isn't relying upon the frontline trustworthy witnesses uh, around the world. These are the cultural entrepreneurs who now step in and open up this whole phenomenon for you and me and for London theatre goers. And in a related um, uh, uh, sense uh, as well, this was an, a performance that I uh, 
experienced myself uh, last December uh, in Fiji. This was a, a performance called Maona, The Rising uh, of the Sea. It was a, 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 a theatrical musical dance performance uh, written by a, a Fijian playwright uh, called Vilsoni Heroniko, very, a very famous uh, Fijian uh, artist. And he worked with musicians and uh, a, a dance troupe. And what he did in his, in his performance was to bring together the mythical stories that Pacific cultures have grown up with and are familiar with, the music, the idioms, the symbols. And he, he wove a story around the rising sea using these different forms of cultural uh, repertoires. So again, an example of a cultural entrepreneur uh, making uh, climate change uh, visible. And as I wrote myself uh, in the quote here, this is exactly what I was uh, meaning, I think, when I say climate is an idea which encapsulates the immersion of the physical with the cultural in which local and global dynamics interweave and where the memory of the past meets the possibilities of the future. Or well, then we have, again, in this making climate change visible uh, category, we have other um, uh, examples uh, of how this uh, can be done through uh, cultural entrepreneurs. Um, this collection of poetry that was published uh, a few years ago, Feeling the Pressure, Poetry in the Science of Climate Change. Um, a variety of contemporary poets taking climate change and trying to make it visible through poetry. And just to give you an example, I'd like to read one very brief one from one of our more famous English poets, Andrew Motion, who for many years was the poet laureate, the, the Queen's poet uh, in England. Um, and so here is Andrew Motion in his poem called Here and Now making climate change visible. In the garden, southerly, but with my ear cocked to acoustic north, another milk tooth cuts loose from its glacier into the gorgeous Arctic, ripples like raindrops then, and this May evening, sap rising quick again through the hard heart of my bare mulberry tree. Water music in the grain. So we have these three positions that Rudyard Gould suggests and I, I find particularly helpful in thinking through this idea of climate change and how it moves from global to local and from local to global and how it engages with different people uh, around uh, the world. The invisibilists, the visibilists, and the making climate change visible. And the questions then that we have in thinking this through is, do we in fact, do we start with global climate change and the practices of science? The, uh, abstractions uh, and the graphs and, and the, the diagrams which actually many people would find very hard to relate to. Many of our citizens whether here or in other cultures around the world would find that very hard to really embrace those types of scientific uh, descriptions of global climate change. Or do we start with the visible and lived local experiences of people in different places. And those experiences that people have will, have will carry different implications, different meanings. As I mentioned, the study by Capstick and Pigeon, uh, believing is seeing, as much as seeing is believing. And so if we rely on these local experiences of people, we actually may find a much more varied set of stories that people will tell us about what climate change means for them. 
And my, my sense, my argument that I guess I have been uh, uh, making more recently, in recent, re recent years, although a lot of my earlier work was actually done on the, the statistics and the numbers and the, the scenarios and the predictions and the models, but, but more recently I've become more interested uh, and more convinced that actually it's, it is these local expressions, these local experiences, uh, and the interesting ways that cultural entrepreneurs, these people who try to make climate change visible, these actually carry much more power in the world to change people and to engage people than any number of graphs and models uh, that come from science. So uh, I will just skip those few slides, I think. Uh, end up again with uh, uh, my these three points uh, that come from the uh, Rudyard Gould case, uh, and thank you uh, uh, very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Mike, for this thought-provoking presentation. If I remember correctly, the German poet Johann Wolfgang von Goethe wrote in the mid-18th century, you see only what you know, which mm -hmm. quite apparently relates to that. Any questions? Gibt es Fragen? Ich muss mehr ins Mikrofon sprechen. Gibt es Fragen, Kommentare, natürlich auch in deutscher Sprache? Das hat alle erst mal umgehauen. So people are very impressed. Bitte, Christian. Warte kurz aufs Mikrofon, bitte. However, to me, in some uh, um, point, it's also about expert opinion. So people start to be skeptic about expert opinions due to several reasons in many, many different issues in the past. And um, your idea is to transport it completely differently and that might make a, a much better impact, much more impact than the expert opinion does. However, the world is really complex and it's sometimes maybe a, a bit too simplifying. And my idea would, would be, or my question is, do you see any combination of this expert opinion that we typically try to express and this more simple, maybe more uh, easy, uh, acceptable way to transport climate change? Yes, so, uh, of course, there might, be, there might be some people who would want to interpret my argument as meaning that uh, scientific expertise and enlightenment has no value, no place, and that's not what I'm arguing for at all. Let's be clear about that. Um, but, I, but I think your question is pointing to this very difficult question about the relationship between expert opinion in the case of climate change, for example, as captured by the IPCC, but these very different ways that most ordinary citizens experience their world and their beliefs are actually held much more tightly to their experiences than to the graphs of the IPCC. And this is, this is uh, for many, uh, actually, this is really the very heart of the, 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 the public um, discourse on, on climate change, is how these two worlds meet <laughs> or, or, or disagree. Uh, uh, um, to what extent do we always have to defer to the expert? And this, of course, is actually now much wider than just climate change. It's, it's the whole question about uh, the, the, the governance of society, or in uh, Uruk Beck's famous idea of risk society, is if we are now living in a risk society, then who are the people who actually are authorized to reveal and to talk about the risk? Is it the technocrats? Is it the, the scientific uh, advisors to the chancellor? Or is it actually the local people who actually are exposed to the risks? And so actually this is, you know, this opens up this much bigger challenge of how we want our societies to be governed. 
through the technocrats and the elite expertise, basing on their scientific analysis and their judgment? Or do we want to open up to our citizens with their different experiences, some of which will come into conflict, perhaps, with the expert judgment? And yet, in a, in a democracy, we cannot afford to silence those voices. Or I would argue we can't. So, so I mean, your question, I've got no answer to your question, but I, I do think, and this is why I like this, this framing that, that Rudyard Gold argues, because it throws up this, this dilemma as to when do we defer to the experts? When do we listen to our citizens? And how do we make decisions? Well, this provokes me to a remark and sort of little Chautauqua with you. When we look at today's society, especially a Central European, or let's say a European society, we have a fairly high level of education, which is sort of a science-based education in the broadest sense, and we have a rather big distance to experiences of the individual with nature because we have segregated ourselves from nature. And many people truly, really don't know any longer where the milk comes from or anything like that. So with this lacking experience of phenology, for instance, that the Inuit may have or that the uh, Maasai would be having, etc., etc., is there really for our societies in industrialized countries, and I include Australia, US, Canada, etc., is there a real potential for the visibilist? Or would it take away potential? In other societies, this may be rather different. I don't think it does take away the visibilist argument, e e even in our, our societies at all. I mean, I think, yes, we've been exposed in European culture for, for, for many generations now to a scientific paradigm, if you will, um, through our science education. But that scientific paradigm uh, still coexists, I think, with our own more intuitive uh, lived experiences of places, uh, uh, and, I, and I think, uh, you know, the, ar the, the argument I started with, or the example I started with about the Somerset levels and the flooding in the Somerset levels. Mm. Uh, so these, these are actually quite well-educated farmers. They're quite wealthy farmers. Um, they've been living in these uh, low-lying areas of Western England, f in some cases, for, for generations. Many of them would rely upon you know, scientific uh, agricultural technologies and fertilizers. So they're, they're very happy and familiar with working with the products of a, of a scientific uh, society. But their, their, their experience of those flooding episodes and how they interpreted those flooding episodes came as much out of their cultural history. Uh, and, you know, very often you would hear them talking on the media about, well, my grandfather was farming this land uh, 80 years ago. Um, and, and so what you found, if you listened to these farmers speaking, was this, this sort of interweaving of both the, 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 a scientific mind, but also a deeply culturally embedded set of experiences. So I think actually, even in, within Europe, we find these two worlds, you know, they're, they're mixed up together. Mm. Um, we don't all live by the, the, the numbers of science. Um, many of us, I think, still actually live by these intuitive, quite powerful senses of place and mm. belonging. Um, and so I think the visibilist case actually still can, can carry a lot of power and weight, mm -hmm. even, even within um, within European societies. And if you then go to other cultures, uh, I mean, most recently I've, I've spent some time in the Pacific. Um, and I think similarly there, you, you see this intermingling of two different uh, minds because, you know, many of these Fijians that I met, you know, they, they've had science education. Um, they understand some of the basic um, scientific accounts of climate change, but yet they have this very strong sense of identity as Pacific Islanders. Mm 
who have lived with the ocean for countless generations, mm -hmm. and they have the stories that they can tell about that ocean. And so they too bring these two different worlds together uh, uh, and, and try to make sense of what's happening mm -hmm. by drawing upon both forms of reasoning. Mm -hmm. I, I, so, I, so actually, I think um, one finds these, these inter, this inter, intermingling uh, in, in many different places around the world, which comes back to the, the question we just asked there. Of course, it makes it then very difficult. Who do we listen to most powerfully in government? The expert or the citizen? Yeah, bitte, please. Uh, Professor Han, I would have a question. Um, most of the arguments of the visibilists are negative messages to engage people, and in, in many cases they are already shocking. Do you see do you see possibility that uh, people could be engaged uh, to climate change through positive messages? So do you mean the visibilist positions are quite negative? I'm not sure I'd necessarily go along with that. Uh, I mean, my understanding of the visibilist argument would be that we listen to the voices of people who have got deep experience of weather and its consequences in particular places. And those visibilists may say, yes, things are changing and these risks are new, perhaps, and threatening. But as equally, they may also tell us we have great capabilities within our society, within our community. We've lived with risks that are similar to this for many years or for countless generations, and we have ways of handling this. Um, so again, there's a certain ambiguity. I don't think I would necessarily say that they automatically come through with a very negative and helpless sense of vulnerability. Uh, and again, let me give the example of some of the Pacific Islanders. Y yes, they, they, they know what it is like to live on a low-lying island with, surrounded by vast oceans which bring cyclones and high tides. They know what that's like. But they don't see themselves as helpless or powerless. They actually see themselves as people who are very capable. They survived in these uh, islands for, for generation after generation. So actually there's a certain empowering of listening to the visibilists. It's not necessarily, I don't think, a, a negative, helpless type of story. But I accept it's not simple. There's, again, there's ambiguity uh, in, in this. Um, so I think if we're thinking about adaptation, you know, how, do, how do societies, how do communities, how do people adapt to these changing risks? Uh, one also can, it's kind of, it comes back to decision making. Do you, do, does adaptation always rely upon the outside technical expert to come in and say, this is how you have to adapt to climate risk? Or does adaptation as much come out of the local community there's a very good example that I often use to illustrate this point in England. A study that was done in a northern English town called Pickering, which is prone to flooding. It's, it's on a river quite near some hills. Quite often there's flash floods that comes down. Um, and in the 1990s, there were a number of these floods. And, and so there was concern about how to protect, how to adapt this town to increase flood risk. And so this team came in from outside of geomorphologists, hydrologists, engineers, to come up with a plan, an adaptation plan, which was going to go back to the Environment Agency, who would then put 10 million euros and protect the town of Pickering. 
What this team discovered, though, in developing their data, talking with the citizens of Pickering, was that there was a lot of local knowledge, historical memory of where the particular river moved, what heights it reached, um, previous experience, or this farmer tried to put a dike in this part of the catchment 30 years ago, and this is what happened. Yeah? So this deep cultural memory, historical memory, was, was in the citizens. And so the team completely changed the way they went about their adaptation strategy. Rather than doing all the outside technical modeling, they created what they called these competency groups. So citizens alongside technical skilled people. And they came up with a very different adaptation strategy, which actually was so different that the Environment Agency refused to fund it, even though it had been produced by the citizens and by the experts together. So that just illustrates my point about adaptation can also rely upon local knowledge as much as technical outside expertise. Ich sehe keine weiteren Meldungen. Bitte. Ich erlaube mir eine, einen Hinweis. Sie haben sich sehr auf Hochwasserereignisse und Starkniederschläge konzentriert in Ihren Beispielen. Ich erlaube mir an extrem Temperaturen in Australien zur Jahreswende und an die starke Hitzewelle in Russland 2010 zu erinnern. Uh, excessive temperatures. So I'm reminded of, of, of temperature extremes, uh, is your point, I think. Um, in relation to adaptation, uh, I mean, just following on the example I've just given about flood, uh, adaptation to flood risk, I, I would want to make the same argument about how one develops adaptation strategies to extreme temperature, uh, in that, in that, there is technical knowledge, and in the, on, in the Australian case as well, I think this is very uh, 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 visible. You can see the technical experts, but actually also working with uh, local Australian communities and farmers who, of course, are, are the ones who are exposed uh, to these bushfires. And so again, a combination of local expertise and outside technical expertise will produce the most reliable uh, adaptation strategies. Bitte. Ja, also ich fand den Vortrag sehr gut und uh, ich erinnerte mich an die DDR-Zeit, als in der kirchlichen Umweltbewegung ja Betroffenheitsberichte uh, in unserem Land, also eine ganz große Wirkung hatten, es fehlte viel Impact auf die Menschen, weil es keine Betroffenheitsberichte gab, die auf diese Betroffenheitsberichte reagieren, die viele Eyewitnesse visibles und auch gerade die Rolle der Kunst, die sie herausstellen, ich denke, die also Kunst hat auch in der DDR äh, vieles as you put also erlebbar it. gemacht. Also a lot of things were, sehr gut. were made heute visible wir es ja, via cultural uh, dass viele uh, means and even today we can see that a lot of uh, uh, people are silenced or calmed by Aber wenn Menschen, administration who say the limits are kept, but uh, if there are health risks and kann das in einer Gesellschaft ja sehr vieles bewegen. Es kann sozusagen die Grenzwerte äh, verändern. Es kann also Diskussionen äh, in die Wege bringen. Ich denke, es sind viele Ansätze, die Sie uns hier aus London mitgebracht haben. Und ein sehr guter Startpunkt, den Sie uns heute gelehrt haben. Danke schön. <lacht>